All right. Hello, everyone. Um, we are going to go ahead and start our second lecture for the semester. This one is titled Women's Labor in Revolutionary America. So we're still on this uh, series of lectures that's pre-1877. Remember that traditional start date for some labor history classes that kick off with this, uh, the Great Railroad Strike, the end of Reconstruction after the Civil War and kind of the emergence of industrialization in the United States. So this lecture is going to, is still one of these that's predating that. And it's because we're trying to approach labor history from this more inclusive and intersectional framework that stresses the labor of um, people who are often underrepresented in history, not only just in history, but in other aspects of like the social sciences, economic, social, and political uh, culture and structures in today's world, marginalized communities. We want to create a historical narrative that takes uh, the, hetero the heterogeneity and the uh, complexity of the U.S.'s population into full consideration. And so um, this lecture is going to be talking about um, labor specific to uh, the majority of women in the United States prior to this 1877. So we kind of have to start off with this caveat of chronology, right? A lot of times when historians talk about um, the revolutionary period in American history, they're talking about the Revolutionary War and a couple decades after uh, the 83, 1783, of course, Treaty of Paris that ends with Great Britain recognizing American independence. So this revolutionary period will sometimes go until 1800. Sometimes it will go a little, a couple decades after into 1820, very rarely, but occasionally historians will extend this revolutionary period to the 1850s, really just right up before the Civil War. Um, that might be a little expansive because the United States in 1777 is very different from the United States in 1850. Um, but for the purposes of this lecture, we are going to be talking about some uh, themes and events and kind of uh, structural changes that are taking place in American labor as we get closer to the Civil War. Um, so the majority of the lecture will be on this revolutionary period, but if we kind of uh, toward the end of the lecture as we discuss topics like professionalization and the end of cottage industries with the emergence of uh, new industrial processes. That's not necessarily exclusive to the revolutionary period, but they are, um, we get to that point by getting through the revolutionary period. And so as we get to the end of the, of the lecture, just know that some of these topics aren't going to be uh, readily um, related to like 1780 food for thought. But of course, we're going to start off with some reading recommendations. Um, I want to begin every lecture with, uh, with a reading recommendation in case the lecture topic is interesting to you. For today, we're actually going to have two recommendations. Um, each book kind of tackles uh, one component of this lecture in its own way. And I didn't really want to privilege one of these selections over the other, so you're just going to get two. And the first one, which is all the way on the right, is uh, Work Engendered Toward a New History of American Labor. As its title suggests, it's very, um, it coincides with this new labor history that kind of uh, begins to come of age in the United States at the end of the 60s and the early 1970s and really starts to gain steam uh, as we get closer and closer toward the new millennium. Work Engendered isn't one solid book. It's actually a collection of scholarly articles, essays, and papers that kind of tackle different aspects of labor history um, and views labor history along a gendered framework, right? It's edited by Ava Barron. Uh, so if you're, if you're going through a book collection that's alphabetized by author, Ava Barron didn't write all of these articles, but she will be listed as the primary editor. Work Engendered is a very uh, useful piece of scholarship, specifically because it's going to give you a wide range of, of different topics and views related to labor history uh, and viewing it from a gendered lens. It, kind, uh, it definitely takes existing labor history and it asks the question, what about women? A lot of uh, labor histories prior to the arrival of the new labor history were very masculinist. 
Um, they kind of just assumed that the worker was normatively male and that women workers were kind of um, these self-isolated categories. There were women and there were workers, which of course we know is not the case today. Um, but we know this is not the case today because of scholars like those who wrote for Work and Gendered and other new labor history books kind of challenge that notion of the American worker as just default male. The second book, which is on the left, is Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity. This one is very much less a labor history book than it is a book on um, women, gender, and sexuality uh, theory. Sometimes there's an umbrella that's applied, it's called queer theory. Sometimes it's queer and feminist theory or feminist and queer theory. Um, to keep things in a relatively layman context, uh, kind of way, gender trouble basically is this very formative, uh, this very formative work that Butler produces in the 1990s. It's considered a cornerstone of queer theory. And it interrogates the differences between biological sex and social constructions of gender. And we'll be getting into that uh, in a little bit here. But the big takeaway that Butler provides us with is that social roles and social defined expectations for a person depending on their biological sex con uh, constitute what we know of as gender. So a lot of times when, you know, there's this uh, ongoing kind of meme informal cultural debate around gender, how many genders are there? Are there two? Are there more? Are there zero? Um, Butler kind definitely opens the floodgates for that discussion when she provides us with this concept of gender performativity. Um, and so if uh, social constructions of gender, of gender roles and their relation to biological sex are something that either you don't understand that well or are interesting you and you do want to learn more about them uh, in addition to what you already know. Uh, Butler's Gender Trouble is very much uh, a book that everyone points to as a, as a good start. It can be a little dense sometimes, um, but if uh, you kind of struggle through those more uh, difficult to grasp concepts, uh, reading Gender Trouble and really kind of understanding its core arguments uh, can be an incredibly rewarding and generative experience. So those are the two readings that I highly suggest if uh, the concept of women's labor in American history and historiography and in labor in general, including in today's society, if those things are interesting, these books might, uh, you might enjoy them as well. But before we get into uh, the concept of, of women's labor, of labor that's divided along gendered lines, we should probably start out with a couple of base, uh, basic definitions, right? And the first two that I really want to focus in on here are the difference between sex and gender. A lot of times people use sex and gender kind of interchangeably. Um, as You've probably gleaned from my discussion of uh, my very brief discussion of uh, Butler's book. There is a there is some subtle differences there. There's some nuance, and so it's worth kind of going into that here. For our purposes, uh, sex, the noun, not the verb, um, constitutes a series of biological traits that are used to differentiate between uh, female intersex and male people. Now, depending on how someone uh, constructs their own definition of gender or how a society constructs uh, their um, subjective or relative constructions of, sorry, not of gender of sex, uh, these, can, these uh, definitions can depend on a couple of different aspects, right? So there's anatomy, there's hormones, there's chromosomes, and there's genetic aspects, all of which can fall under this, uh, this umbrella division of sex. It's also worth knowing that, uh, or repeating that sex isn't binary. A lot of times people just uh, articulate that there are only men and there are only women. This isn't the case. There are also intersex people, there are asexual people. There is an entire spectrum of biological sex that is often uh, reduced to a dichotomy by the medical profession. So a person who was born intersex will uh, usually undergo reconstructive surgeries before they reach adulthood or even childhood to kind of put them into one camp of male or female, right? Um, so sex is very much the biology of it. Uh, in contrast to uh, biological traits, there is also gender. And gender, instead of uh, being inherently linked to any kind of biology, 
is actually a system of socially prescribed rules and roles uh, that are given to each of these two dichotomous sexes, right? Most societies, uh, in terms of their articulations of gender, are binary. So in, in sex, biological sex, there's men and women. Intersex people are often left out of that. And then in gender, there are masculine and feminine genders. And uh, alternatives to those two uh, binary approaches are often marginalized or excused or entirely overlooked and erased. There are, of course, uh, exceptions to the rule. There are, are numerous uh, societies throughout the world, some patriarchal, some matriarchal, that afford and allow space for uh, genders that are not strictly masculine and feminine. There are third, fourth, fifth, and upwards of that numbers of genders in different societies and cultures. But in today's world, this kind of, uh, which is kind of Western dominated um, and North American and Eurocentric, uh, the model of two uh, binary genders has kind of uh, become the norm. It's become this dominant uh, construction of how we understand gender. So the takeaway, if I'm talking too much, sex is largely biological, can be driven by a couple of different aspects. So it's not only anatomical, but it's also hormonal, chromosomal, and genetic. And then gender is the social construct. We're also going to talk very quickly about patriarchy. A lot of times um, people will conflate uh, sexism with patriarchy. Sexism is the existence of this disproportionate system of power that favors one sex, men, over another sex, women. Um, patriarchy is a little bit uh, more nuanced and complicated than sexism, and it's much more, um, it's much more encompassing, right? So patriarchy is a system of social structures and practices that privilege the male sex and masculine genders as desirable, default, and to the norm. Under patriarchal systems, men are socially encouraged to dominate, oppress, and exploit women, while women face substantial barriers towards any kind of parity in politics, uh, society, or an economic equity or equality. So whereas sexism is very much uh, more this belief that men are superior and kind of curtailed, um, structures are curtailed to support uh, the supremacy of men, patriarchy uh, is a much more entrenched system that includes uh, anti-women sexist bias, but can also incorporate a lot of other elements uh, into justifying the supremacy of men over women. Um, and so that comes right not only in the male sex, but also masculine genders as being desirable, right? Um, there is the notion of being hardworking. There is the notion of being able to suppress your emotions. These are all um, masculine traits uh, coming from the masculine gender that are not necessarily tied to uh, male biological sex um, that are also viewed as this desirable default. And then lastly, we also have heteronormativity. Heteronormativity is a widespread social and cultural bias towards patriarchal, heterosexual two-parent families as this primary form of social organization, right? So you have the two-parent family that's heterosexual. You have a husband and you have a wife, and the husband is usually, uh, or in terms of heteronormativity, is in charge of the family, and the wife is um, more subservient. And then they have uh, X number of children not too many, not too few, just the right amount. Uh, that's kind of viewed also in addition to patriarchy as this norm for society, as this uh, social building block of, uh, of cultural organization. Heteronormativity can be reinforced through religious agreements like marriage, um, and it can be kind of hard to investigate heteronormativity if you don't know uh, that there are other competing systems uh, that, can, that heteronormativity contests with, right? Uh, this is sometimes referred to as the Christmas effect. If, if you think about the season of Christmas, right, the United States is ostensibly a secular society. Uh, but every uh, December, and I suppose November and October and parts of September too, uh, every end of, a, of the year, our entire society and culture kind of refocuses itself away from uh, secular institutions like public education, the workplace, and it kind of pivots toward the celebration of, of the holidays of Christmas. Of, uh, and if it's not of Christmas exactly, of uh, related Judeo-Christian uh, rituals and festivals. 
And even though not everyone in the United States is Christian, and even though not everyone in the United States uh, practices regular religious services, this doesn't mean that uh, they can kind of escape from the cultural presence of Christmas, right? If you don't celebrate Christmas, that's all well and good, but you're still going to run into it in, in December. And this is kind of how uh, patriarchy and heteronormativity work, right? They're kind of viewed as just a given and uh, different ways of constructing family and friendships and relationships, differences in, in how you view gender and biological sex. These things are marginalized and they're kind of covered up by this dominant narrative of heteronormativity. So these are just a couple of core concepts that you'll wanna keep in mind as we go through um, the rest of this lecture. So we have sex is biological. It is dependent on different traits, not only anatomical, but other internal factors. Gender is a social construct. Patriarchy is a system of interlocking uh, structures and practices that reinforce male supremacy and masculine gender over the female sex and femininity. And heteronormity, heteronormativity in a very similar way kind of emphasize uh, the family, the heterosexual family unit as kind of the be all end all form of social organization in contrast to other models that might exist. These are important to understand because they will definitely contextualize the experiences not only of women workers in US history, but uh, also men. Um, men are also very much affected by patriarchal structures, right? There's toxic masculinity that men are exposed to coming of age and growing up and it throughout their lives. And also uh, people who are not heterosexual, people who are um, bisexual, homosexual, asexual, or agendered, or in other forms uh, have some other aspect of queerness in their identity that doesn't really fall under this, uh, this category of what's socially desirable and normal. And so you may be saying, okay, so women aren't viewed as the norm. Um, women workers might not necessarily be viewed as like the pillar of economic activity. Uh, what is, how bad is that really though, right? Well, patriarchal oppression and heteronormativity mean that women uh, experience lessened economic opportunity. Um, this can be regardless of their education or any kind of other qualifications. And this is especially true for women of color, right? Women who are going into the workforce are routinely uh, to this day still paid less than male counterparts and are considered for fewer professional opportunities and are generally perceived as being less competent regardless of any contrary evidence, right? Um, I have a lot of uh, women colleagues who have told me horror stories working in customer service, working in IT fields or any sort of really any sort of uh, position where they're expected to hold uh, expert or specified knowledge. Um, I'm not going to name names, obviously, but I have uh, one colleague who's actually just recently telling me about how uh, she used to work at a computer um, IT repair center. So like if, if you worked at a, at a store and your computer broke down, you would call a number and she was the person um, that you reached on the phone. Uh, she would also answer emails, right? And so she would sign off uh, her name, which was a normative feminine sounding name. And she would always get significant pushback uh, from the people she was helping. They would ask her, you know, are you sure this is, this is the problem? Have you thought that it might be this? Uh, have you tried doing this? I just don't think that you're considering all the, all the potential problems that's, that are going on with these computers. And she realized that once she changed her email signature to, uh, to a masculine sounding name, right, a nickname for herself that sounded masculine, suddenly she was getting a lot less pushback. And this isn't to say that all of these individual customers who are calling or emailing her asking for help with their computers are hearing her voice or seeing her name and thinking, oh, well, she's a woman, she doesn't know anything about this. Um, a lot of times sexism and patriarchal systems of oppression, heteronormativity, they're subconscious. Um, they're kind of just learned preferences that just pop up um, in day-to-day -day interactions. And if you aren't actively questioning those kinds of biases, they can kind of take over when you're not actively thinking how you respond in workplace situations or in situations where you're interacting with people who have expert knowledge that you don't have, right? 
And so this is just one of many, many examples where women who have special specified knowledge that I can even pull on uh, in from my from my own daily experience and the experiences with my colleagues, where you might have all of the education and the training you need, but because of these cultural and socially uh, entrenched views toward women as lesser or non-normative or not desirable, these show up and they can affect uh, the lived experiences of women. How else? Well, women and women's concerns are marginalized in critical fields like medicine and healthcare, political representation, and education. Um, there are a slew of Ivy League co colleges that did not allow women to admit and study uh, at their institutions until incredibly late into the 20th century, um, later than even some historians of women, gender, and sexuality would even view as, as realistic. Uh, in medicine and healthcare, because men are so often viewed as uh, normative subjects, medicines, uh, surgeries, and treatments are designed to fit their biological specificity. And so women are um, kind of treated as auxiliary. They're brought in for medical procedures that weren't designed for women's biology and weren't really designed to take into consideration um, different uh, hormonal balances that are in women that differ from men or different anatomy, um, these sorts of things, that can have pretty bad consequences, right? If you've only tested a medicine on men in food and drug trials, and then you release it and uh, women have an adverse reaction to it because of differences in hormones or differences in anatomy, that can be incredibly harmful. This is also true of political representation. Obviously, white women weren't allowed to vote in this country until uh, the 1920s. Um, it's much later for many uh, African-American women or other women of color. Um, the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s did more to sure up voting rights for women of color in this country, but that doesn't mean that once the Voting Rights Act was signed, every woman could suddenly vote. So there's always been disproportionate uh, access for women to political representation. And then lastly, women are, not lastly, but just a third of many other potential bullet points we could put on this list. Women are frequently the target of domestic and sexual violence. Disproportionately, that number is astronomically high. This isn't just at home, this is in the workplace. And women who speak out against uh, instances of domestic and sexual violence are often the subject of informal retaliation or direct violent retaliation, right? So. A woman who complains about sex-based discrimination at work, um, she might even uh, see that one instance, she might even see that instance rectified. But going forward, it's unlikely um, that a woman who reports that kind of discrimination is going to be able to, is going to be afforded the same kinds of consideration for promotions, right, or for new training opportunities. All of these, uh, all of these examples we've listed are not, it's not a conclusive list, right? As I said, there's many other ways where patriarchal oppression and heteronormativity affect the daily lives of women. And again, the, uh, the daily lives of men as well. Uh, before we jump into the actual historiography and the history of the lecture, I do just want to also specify one final, um, one final point, and that is, is that patriarchal systems and other sexist practices aren't always performed as visible, hostile, misogynist acts, right? Sometimes patriarchal oppression, sometimes sexism can demonstrate itself in ways that seem very positive, but are in fact um, barriers to, to equality and equity for women in not only in the workplace, but in a wider society at large, right? So these systems can be multifaceted and they can reinforce themselves through a lot of different ways. And I have this handy infographic here on the left of examples between hostile sexism and benevolent sexism, right? So in a good example of hostile sexism is misogyny, right? You have these negative and antagonistic attitudes towards women because of your own um, ideologies or your own feelings toward them. There are specific beliefs that women are inferior. These can be um, politically based. They can be based in pseudoscience. They can be based in religious or theological scriptures or cultural practices uh, that might even just not be related to religion at all, but are just kind of 
these traditional ways of viewing uh, differences in gender. Uh, sometimes uh, if you read a lot of ancient literature and Greek dramas and these sorts of things, women are very much, they're not honorable, they're kind of sneaky and they, uh, they do things with cloak and dagger because that's the feminine way of handling problems and it's inherently not as good as just grabbing a sword and chopping people up. Um, that women are inherently manipulative, uh, that there are negative attributes tied to them because of their sex. And hostile sexism is also uh, sexism that punishes women who go against gender norms, right? They, uh, what is sometimes referred to as transgress. Uh, transgressing, they literally cross over into practices that are reserved for masculine gender or, or the male sex. And punishing women who are doing that um, is a way of negatively reinforcing binaries that divide men and women. So there are very clear examples of hostile sexism. Sometimes it's a little harder to see examples of benevolent sexism, right? Um, practices that we think are good and positive, um, but are still dictated along lines of uh, difference in sex can just uh, as easily um, maintain systems of oppression that keep women from full uh, equality and equity. So uh, articulating women as um, pure and virtued and uh, peaceful and just good and kind in every way uh, is a really good way of justifying um, paternalistic or infantilizing uh, policies or practices towards women, right? We can't let women vote and we can't let women go into the workplace because they're so domestic and pure and they need to be protected by men. That's, that's an example of benevolent sexism, right? Um, benevolent sexism also rewards women who follow traditional gender norms and who don't transgress. So it's not always just punishing women who transgress, it's very much stick and carrot, where women who adopt uh, normative traditional gender norms are rewarded, they're kind of raised up by a, by a society as an example. A good example of this um, might be uh, Ava Peron. Um, she famously wanted to run for the presidency of Argentina with her husband Juan Peron. Um, it actually created a huge controversy. And uh, she ended up saying, well, I decided of my own volition that I didn't actually want to be vice president. So she was raised up even further in Argentinian society. It's like, well, look at what an ideal woman she is. Um, this, of course, I'm realizing is an American labor course, and uh, we're not going to get into Argentina. So Argentina. And so that example might well be lost on us. But um, the point still stands. So now that we have the kind of these core concepts well and articulated, we should go ahead and move on towards the specific experiences of women um, with the arrival of colonization. Now, I didn't want to go all the way back to 1492 like I did with my previous lecture because I didn't want to make any sweeping generalizations of the experiences of native people in, uh, in the Americas, right? In, in discourses around uh, colonial settlement and westward expansion, a lot of times native peoples, um, different uh, Native American tribes will be kind of depicted as more egalitarian, um, as more respectful of women, of women having, of having a more um, equal share of power and say in how Native American communities are kind of run and how decisions are being made. And there is some truth to this. Uh, this isn't to say that all Native American tribes were inherently equal entirely along lines of sex and gender, but when you live in a smaller community that uh, requires um, more and a more equal share of work from everyone to keep the society running, it's a lot, it's more difficult to justify um, to justify dispossessing the, the agency and power of women because they're, they're perceived as, as necessary more than they are in, um, in settled societies, which are very much more uh, masculine and patriarchal. So there is some truth to that. However, at the same time, um, there is just as much evidence looking at uh, different Native American tribes and cultures 
where women did not have that kind of uh, relatively equal status with men. And so it would be, um, it would be a disservice to just come out and, and say, well, all of uh, these cultures were more equal because it's not necessarily true. Um, but I think what we said in our last lecture about the heterogeneity and the complexity of different Native American societies and cultures, that really still holds true here. Some were incredibly, um, they were incredibly uh, egalitarian in how they viewed uh, differences along sex and gender. Um, many of them were not uh, constructed on binary lines. So you might have um, specific articulations of intersex or third genders in some societies where even they are also maintained in, on some egalitarian terms or given like privileged religious status. Uh, but again, in, in some cultures that simply wasn't the case. But keeping that heterogeneity and complexity in mind is, is worthwhile. Now in the North American colonies um, specifically, which were more, uh, at least in the legal, legal traditions in the colonies, were more tied to uh, British common law. This is where we're going to start. And I want to briefly talk about a system that was called coverture. Uh, sometimes it's pronounced coverture. I say coverture because it literally means that a wife is covered under the authority of her husband, right? This is an English common law that kind of just continued in North America after it was brought to the, um, the continent by colonists. And COVID coverture basically uh, is a, it's a series of different mutually supporting marriage and property laws that, um, that maintain that a, a married woman does not have a separate legal existence from her husband, right? Uh, very much coverture is a system of property ownership. Um, under English common law and in the colonies for some time after, you know, um, Jamestown, Virginia, and some of these other colonies started to become settled, uh, coverture was a system that, that continued there. And it was basically, um, women who were not yet married were uh, believed to be legally dependent on their fathers, and just even if they're above the age of 18, um, where they were, uh, they were answerable to their fathers. Their fathers had this, uh, this patriot, their patriarchal duty to kind of oversee the affairs of, of uh, their daughters and kind of manage how they live their lives. This is all kind of tied to notions of purity that women need to, to be pure and chaste in order to, to marry a man. And when they married men, um, all of the uh, kind of parental authority that the dad, the father carried over women was then transferred to the husband. And so a woman could not own her own property. Um, obviously she could not vote um, either because she was a woman or because she didn't own property. And a lot of uh, the early democracies in the American Republic required some form of property ownership in order to participate in elections or represent. It also meant that um, there were a few options of legal recourse if, if a wife was wronged by a husband. Um, courts treated uh, violations of marriage contract, you know, if, uh, very differently in court. If a man cheated, um, that was because his wife had somehow failed him. If a woman cheated on a man, it was because she was licentious and the man could very well, you know, it was in his rights in English common law to beat her, discipline her like he would a child. So under the system of coverture, men, uh, women were very much infantilized and they were kept dependent off of uh, their either their male relatives or their male spouses. This isn't to say that all women were married and that they were all kind of subjected to the system of gendered uh, oppression, but women who resisted becoming married and who very uh, stubbornly outlived their fathers were not treated well by societies. They were kind of, again, viewed as transgressive. And so there were different social institutions or practices that were kind of designed to punish them and make um, resisting marriage and coverture undesirable to young women at the time. Aspects of coverture still survive to this day, it's worth pointing out. Um, I have another colleague who, uh, she did a research paper a, a year or two ago about how in some U.S. states it was not illegal to, um, to force your wife to have sex with you because it was, there's a system of implied consent with marriage. 
where uh, the state maintained this ideology that once a, a woman married a husband, all consent for sexual activity was implied because they were married. And so spousal rape was something that was very hard to uh, bring to courts. Um, in the specific state that she was studying, uh, that state's policy had been reversed. However, um, in other states, there are still challenges to, um, there are still barriers to challenging um, implied consent laws and these sorts of things. Uh, perhaps a less uh, horrifying example would be uh, the practice of, of taking the last name, right? We don't really think about it much in society, uh, especially for men, uh, but when uh, in a normal uh, normative heterosexual marriage, if a man and a woman are married, it's not usually the man who gives up his last name, it's the woman who gives up her last name, her father's last name, mind you, and takes her husband's last name. That's kind of this remnant of the system of coverture where property ownership of a wife was transferred from a father to a husband. And so that's just another example. All of these systems, you know, you might look at, uh, at the policy or, or the practice of changing your last name. You're like, well, that's not altogether terrible. You know, it's unique, it's weird, but it doesn't harm anyone. But you have to remember that all these different practices are interlocking and mutually supportive. And so chain, requiring someone to change their last name uh, upon marriage might not be particularly violent and egregious, but it's just one system part of many that contributes to the justification of more uh, atrocious practices and uh, in be in behaviors towards women who demand equality. So like we said, coverture was a legal framework. It was brought over to the colonies and was uh, this extension of English common law that, uh, that planted roots in, in colonial settlements uh, when, they, when these um, laws were brought over by European colonists. A system of coverture actually falls under a wider historical framework that is known as the culture of domesticity. Um, sometimes it's referred to as the cult of domesticity or the cult of true womanhood. This is actually um, one of these uh, recent innovations in history in terms of historiography. It was introduced in the mid, mid 1960s, I believe in 1966, don't quote me on that date, but in the mid, mid to late 1960s, a historian named Barbara Welter uh, articulated this idea of the culture of domesticity. And this is this um, kind of trans-historical pressure of women to resign themselves out of the, out of the affairs, of, out of masculine affairs, the affairs of men, and to really more specifically focus on, uh, focus on women's issues, uh, women's culture, women's past. Under the culture of domesticity, there are two different spheres, dichotomous spheres, mutually exclusive. They are supposed to divide uh, sex and gender, not only in terms of labor, but in terms of wider society. Um, so according to Barbara Welter, uh, and supported by uh, systems like coverture, the proper place for a woman under the culture of uh, domesticity was the domestic sphere. Um, the domestic sphere is basically uh, the, main, the maintenance of the home, the rearing of children, um, religious and secular education where uh, systems of public schooling hadn't yet existed. It was uh, up to the mother to kind of raise children and view them with, uh, with Christian values. Um, and by contrast, uh, men were kind of uh, consigned to this public sphere uh, that kind of oversaw economic activity, employment, political participation, um, social organizations, community organizations, any sort of uh, outward public facing representation of a household was this public sphere. And women were by and large excluded from the public sphere in the culture of domesticity, while men were by and large encouraged uh, to be in the public sphere it was good for, for a man to be invested in the domestic sphere because under the system of coverture, you're 
your wife who presided over the domestic sphere was still this um this person that you had to that you would that men would have to manage right um women were still treated uh under the culture of domesticity and in the domestic sphere as kind of uh they were treated like children this infantilization um they were looked down on and not uh really quite as competent as men had been. And so a man would occupy the public sphere, would still kind of dictate terms of the domestic sphere to his wife, who was answerable to him um, in this culture of domesticity. So we have uh, kind of a good example of these two spheres here, right? The, uh, the domestic sphere, this feminine sphere um, was where most of women's labor was relegated to in colonial times and in, in the history of the early American Republic. So we have this home upkeep, we have child rearing, we have uh, in, uh, educational instruction, be it religious or secular. This isn't to say that there were atheist households in, in colonial times, there may have been, uh, they weren't necessarily uh, widely known or historically present, a lot of, uh, a lot of households were just expected to be some kind of Christian, but this secular education in contrast to religious education would be like teaching your children how many are in a dozen, right? There, in a dozen eggs, there are 12 of them. That's an example of secular education. Uh, God, theology, angels, they don't really factor into that. So secular education also fell on women. And then any other kind of unpaid work that meant in, that went into uh, maintaining the house, making sure children um, and the husband and other dependents, like if parents, if the house was multi-generational and you had parents living in the house with a married couple, making sure they were uh, fed and provided for, um, making sure that uh, tears and clothes were sewed up, all of this unpaid work that a household depended on also fell under this domestic sphere. There's actually a term for all of that unpaid work. We touched on it a little bit in our last, um, our first discussion, and uh, we'll get into it more in a little bit here, but reproductive labor. And then by contrast, again, in the masculine public sphere, we have law and politics, market commerce, citizenship, and paid employment. Again, transgression of any of these spheres uh, would usually um, prompt some kind of retaliation. It could differ depending on um, the different contexts or the specific nature of transgressions. Um, these range from social ostracization to downright physical sexual violence, including killing and murder. Uh, social ostracization is a very um, is a very uh, popular way that a society handled women who refused to marry. They were usually excluded from social circles. They were kind of uh, relegated to the outskirts of town. Um, or if they, they weren't employed in any kind of, of lucrative professions, but if they were employed, it was usually in, uh, in the domestic sphere serving um, more affluent households, right? So a woman who refused to marry might become an, a maid. Uh, back in Europe, where religious and theological institutions were more established, um, women who refused to marry might be kind of uh, pushed into a nunnery by their family to avoid the, the public shame of this transgression. It was a lot easier to say, well, so-and-so went and, and joined the convent than it was to um, come out to your friends, family, and neighbors and say, well, Sarah doesn't want to get married and we're going to support that decision. That just wasn't something um, that was widely practiced at the time. And so social ostracization is one example. Um, actual physical violence uh, aimed at women is, uh, is an example of what was commonly done if a woman was, um, for example, found to be cheating on her husband, especially in colonial times uh, where corporate punishment was still widely used. That's like floggings or whippings, these sorts of things. Um, could be used to punish women who were infantilized well uh, men who cheated were often, um, that blame was redirected at the wife for failing in some regard for over her uh, domestic duties there. So we have this concept of reproductive labor. We've already spent a little bit about a, a little bit of time on it, but I just kind of want to um, flesh it out a bit more than we already have. As we've said, reproductive labor is all of this work that's related to domestic tasks. Um, it is almost always unpaid or uncompensated. Uh, those who claim it 
is paid and compensated for will uh, point to the fact that a woman who performs reproductive labor and isn't employed outside the home still enjoys all of the all of the benefits that come from uh, inhabiting a home, right? You still live indoors. You're not um, you're not living on the streets. That's uh, that's payment for reproductive labor, right? Um, the wages that the husband makes go to um, paying for bills, utilities, food that that wives eat. So there have been kind of these uh, patriarchal arguments that reproductive labor is compensated, but not in any kind of meaningful way that gives women agency as workers. A lot of times reproductive labor is something that is just socially and culturally uh, articulated as, as an expectation. Um, the next time, if you're, uh, if you're a younger individual and you don't know to look out for this, the next uh, time you go have Thanksgiving dinner, it might not be this year because of everything going on, but the next time you go have Thanksgiving dinner, um, try and pay attention to who, uh, without prompting, begins cleaning uh, the table, who begins doing dishes, who does all of the cooking um, to begin with that makes a Thanksgiving dinner ready when guests start arriving, right? This is an example of reproductive labor. Socially and culturally, we're kind of trained to expect uh, women doing these types of jobs, right? Obviously, um, my mom is going to cook the turkey because if my dad do it, did it, he would burn it. And my mom is just so much a much better cook, right? That's an example of benevolent sexism. Look how great of a job my mom does in these uh, these traditionally gendered feminine tasks. And then um, that expectation that she's just going to do them and that I'm thankful, but I don't have to really kind of pay her back for any of that. It's something she's happy to do because she's my mom, right? This is how reproductive labor is made to kind of, um, it's articulated as an expectation. It's just something you do. It's what women do. And it's not really questioned, uh, or if you, uh, if you do question it, um, that's when that transgression, that, uh, that reprisal for transgression can come into effect, right? If my aunt comes to eat Thanksgiving dinner and she uh, asks my dad, why is uh why is your wife why is um why is jamie's mom the only one uh doing the dishes well my dad won't get up and go start doing the dishes he'll kind of sulk off and then he'll probably tell my uh my uncle who um is married to a different woman or he might tell his brother that uh that my aunt is you know she's an angry feminist or she's a lesbian or look how unrealistic she's uh being or why does she have to bring politics into thanksgiving there's any number of justifications that can be used um cultural and social tools that can be drawn up on to defend the system of reproductive labor and again this isn't always necessarily done um with any kind of malevolency it's just an implicit bias that people like something snaps and they go to it and they're like, well, this is what I was raised. This is how we do things and I'm going to defend the system. Now, reproductive labor, uh, contrary to um, popular conceptions of reproductive labor as relatively easy, is very demanding. Um, it occupies a lot of time. And regardless of if a woman is, has, is uh, employed or has a career, social uh, pressures and uh, cultural pressures that articulate reproductive labor as, a, as an obligation that only women can fill. Um, these things don't make uh, reproductive labor easy. Reproductive labor is actually kind of essential to the economy because if a house isn't maintained, if uh, food isn't purchased and prepared, if um, things aren't kept in order, uh, things aren't organized, the house uh, budget isn't really uh, managed, if all of these things happen, it's a lot harder for people living in that house to leave and go do um, productive labor, right? So reproductive labor happens within the home and it basically allows for people who work to go out and perform productive tasks, be it at a factory or at school or in a customer service job, that reproductive labor makes that possible. If you aren't being fed, if you don't have a clean, clean place to sleep, if the house isn't being maintained, it's going to be far more difficult for you to work the full 40, 50 hour week um, that requires reproductive labor in order for you to kind of do. Uh, 
So even though reproductive labor is largely um, unpaid and uncompensated, this doesn't mean that it isn't valuable to our economic system. In fact, uh, it's pretty much essential in some capacity or another. So let's return to this concept of the separate spheres, right? Now, Barbara Walters' uh, articulation of the, of the separate spheres is kind of like this two realms that men and women were consigned to in not only their day-to-day -day lives, but for our purposes, specifically labor. Um, it's worth keeping in mind that these, uh, this culture of domesticity more readily applied to middle class and white women. And the, the historical, uh, the ability for us to look back in history and point out, point to the culture of domesticity, it can be pretty easy for us to do when we're um, looking at the framework of normative history that privileges uh, middle class white people, right? And that's what history has done in the United States for a very long time. These new kind of uh, revisionist histories that challenge normative understandings of society and culture in the US throughout history have started to kind of interrogate these models that have been put forward explaining uh, historical forces and processes in the past. So the culture of domesticity was, uh, as it was articulated in the 60s, very clearly um, centered around whiteness and a middle-class existence. Uh, but not all women kind of fell into this, into this paradigm of, of these separate spheres. And so it's worth uh, mentioning those too. Because if we introduce the culture of domesticity, say there's a, a domestic sphere and a public sphere and women are in one and men are in the other, and then you just move on, that overlooks a lot of groups that have been, as we've said, marginalized throughout history, right? So working class women or women who are surviving on low incomes, um, they're not going to fall uh, under the culture of domesticity because they simply don't have the, the resources um, to not work. Now, this doesn't suddenly mean that they're free uh, from sexism or patriarchal oppression, right? There's still social and cultural institutions and practices and traditions that, that devalue women as people, but also devalue women's labor uh, in preference for male lives and male labor. But, um, but that working class women, uh, women who were uh, in a lower income bracket, oftentimes they could be uh, single women, for example, women who didn't marry they would still face these kinds of systems that were uh, misogynistic. But in addition to that, um, they also, their livelihoods uh, depended on, on them alone, right? So they couldn't, um, they couldn't choose to, to not work. Now this isn't articulated necessarily as, as a freedom. A lot of times uh, women who were consigned to the domestic sphere and this culture of domesticity, they very much wanted their own careers. They wanted to have their own uh, professional hobbies, something that they could devote themselves to and pursue outside of the home. And this wasn't available to them because this just wasn't something that was an option for women. It went against this culture of domesticity. It was transgressive and so it was suppressed. Working class women didn't have those freedoms either. Right, so if you, were, um, if you were on a lower income and you were required to work, this doesn't mean that you can now go become an engineer at Harvard and there's a card that you can show at the door and it's like, well, I make under this certain amount, so I have to, I have to get a job and I want this one. That's not how it works, right? Um, lower income and uh, working class women very much were kind of pushed into the most undesirable and unfulfilling kind of monotonous jobs and they were often still consigned to the domestic sphere. And even then they were often still kind of under this patriarchal authority, the system of coverture that dictated the terms of their own uh, lived experiences and livelihoods to them. So a working class woman who was married would still fall under the coverture of her husband, would still very much not have any sort of economic say. Um, and if a, if a working class or lower income woman was single, um, she's still going to be like, society is still going to push her into these kind of domestic service jobs 
that are away from the public sphere, even though it's some kind of paid employment. There's still going to be those those models that kind of keep them out of of rewarding professional careers that men kind of have reserved for them at this time. Another example is immigrant women um, coming to the United States. They're not going to have uh, the same kinds of resources. Uh, that uh, that come from having a well-established and expansive family already living here. If you're coming here um, either by yourself or only with your husband or with your husband and children, there's there's fewer uh, systems of support for you. And so that can necessitate um, women kind of leaving this domestic sphere and, and seeking employment. Again, though, it doesn't necessarily mean that women have any more freedoms than a woman might have uh, living a middle-class existence. And then again, of course, um, the culture of domesticity does not really apply to enslaved or freed African women. And as uh, you are reading this book by Jennifer Morgan, Laboring Women, um, that will become very apparent as well, especially when we get uh, when Jennifer Morgan gets into kind of uh, racialized difference that's assigned to, to enslaved and freed Black women that are um, to make them viewed at like seen as biologically different from from white women. And so those kinds of ideological and biological arguments that there is, uh, that there's a racialized difference between uh, white women and women of color will kind of exclude women of color from this culture of domesticity to where they will be expected to do very hard and kind of uh, backbreaking manual labor. That being said, um, enslaved and freed African women are still going to be subject to the same patriarchal systems of oppression that white women are, where they'll be expected to do the reproductive labor um, for uh, their community and that allows that community to then turn around and, um, and support either the, uh, the planning aristocracy, the, uh, the slavers, or if um, if they are uh, in fact a free African-American person um, still performing the reproductive labor that allows for the exploitation of work outside of the home in the public sphere. So to kind of uh, recap there super quick, uh, the system of this culture of domesticity was very much uh, articulated around uh, notions of normative whiteness and middle class uh, womanhood in the um, kind of this colonial era and going onward into the uh, the American Republic. But even though there can be uh, there can be exceptions, there can be modifications to that system along uh, different lines of identity, uh, it still is a pretty reasonable framework in explaining how women were expected to stay out of this public sphere. Um, and was very much still kind of supportive and supported by the system of coverture. There are some changes after the American Revolution, though, when we get into this period of, of uh, revolutionary America. It's worth saying that the separate spheres concept remains intact. Uh, depending on who you ask, the separate spheres contact, uh, concept remains intact today. It's just less enforced. It's less uh, codified into law more than it is viewed as like um, a cultural preference, right? Uh, so the, the notion of separate spheres of the culture of domesticity, the domestic sphere and the public sphere, you could very easily argue that those are still very much with it, albeit in a slightly altered form. Um, but after the American Revolution, the nature of how uh, women view themselves in society and how they view their relationship to these separate spheres starts to change a little bit. And um, we're going to spend a lot of time in this lecture kind of getting into how these things uh, start to shift as we go from very much a, a network of colonies exporting goods for trade to your, uh, European and British transatlantic markets and kind of uh, shifting into our own emerging industrial republic. Now, as uh, we, moved, we move on from the American revolutions, uh, American women are going to be increasingly tied to this notion of Republican motherhood. And Republican motherhood is essentially an ideology that uh, differs somewhat from the existing 
uh, European British common law practice of coverture, right? Coverture in forms continues uh, to be maintained throughout US history, obviously, but Republican motherhood and this concept of Republican motherhood gives women um, more agency in terms of what they're allowed to learn or know, um, what is uh, viewed socially, um, like widespread in terms of a, of a society, what is viewed as a, a woman's right to certain things. And um, the actual uh, labor that women are often associated with, right? So they're still kind of socially pressured into this domestic sphere that reproductive or domestic labor uh, starts to become elevated and more dignified. Um, it's seen as a civic and patriotic virtue. And the total uh, expanse of the domestic sphere starts to widen a little bit, giving women um, added options for, uh, for control of their own lives that they may not have had prior under the colonial system. And this really kind of uh, is tied to the American Revolution and the idea of a nation governed by, not necessarily by um, a democratic consensus, but by uh, due representation in the form of like a republic. So Republican motherhood um, was given increased patriotic uh, value because specifically uh, statesmen, um, people participating in the revolution, looking on uh, the emerging uh, American nation are realizing that we want to make sure that a, that a respect and a preference for um, liberty uh, in political terms, obviously for uh, for white property owning men is maintained. And so that means that uh, mothers who have to, of course, raise children, educate children, provide for the home, um, perform all of this reproductive labor, they need to uh, kind of buy into the system as well in order to make sure that children coming of age are taught to value it. And so Republican motherhood argued that in the interest of children coming of age in the new country, women needed to be civically minded um, literate, especially, and religiously knowledgeable. knowledgeable. And this was all uh, definitely for um, the better education and instructive and instruction of, uh, of young men coming of age. Uh, but women were also expected uh, to be able to raise their daughters in a way that uh, coincided with this idea of Republican motherhood, that mothers um, and this uh, kind of cornerstone of social organization, the family, that, that daughters were being raised in a way that um, allowed for the family to be as politically uh, active and participating in, in Republican government as possible, assuming that they were, uh, that they were a demographic group that, that uh, the framers wanted them to do that, right? So Republican motherhood was definitely, uh, of course, less stressed for free Black communities um, in the South or the North. Republican motherhood was very much um, kind of oriented toward uh, white middle and sometimes uh, lower class families. So a, a Republican mother would want to be civically minded so that they can explain um, in the course of secular education, you know, this is what a judicial system is. This is what a representative is. This is why we don't have a king. Literate, obviously, um, to teach uh, their sons and daughters to be literate and religiously knowledgeable um, because the US was, well, um, outwardly not a Christian nation. Um, we have that freedom of religion and uh, which is always either championed or hated depending on who you ask. That freedom of religion, um, also freedom from religion in the US Constitution. We're ostensibly a secular nation, uh, but we have this Christmas effect where Christianity is just seen as this norm. And so Republican motherhood, this ideology of Republican motherhood, uh, then was kind of molded uh, to this normative expression of Christianity. And it's like, well, if our, if our sons and daughters are going to be Christian, we wanna make sure that mother's teaching them no basic Christian theology, these sorts of things. So this stemmed from this concept of the agrarian kind of small family farm 
as being the preferred model of uh, how a family would interact with the rest of society, right? We've already said that property ownership was a pretty core component of early political representation, not only in the colonies, but then in different parts of, of the emerging republic. Um, property ownership was tied to political representation. In some uh, states, you had to own property to vote. In others, you could vote without property, but if you were going to hold uh, a representative office, so like a congressman or a senator or someone on uh, running a city government, uh, you might have to own property in that state or in that city before you could hold any of those elected positions. And so um, all of these different uh, all of these different preferences for property ownership were ostensibly tied to the idea of independence, right? If you live on your own farm, if you are able to provide for yourself and your family, and you're able to basically uh, weather the sun, the summers and the winters um, without needing too much help from anyone else, uh, you, were, you were then a good candidate to participate in the representative system because you weren't beholden to anyone, right? If you were in debt, uh, if you had a landlord, if you were employed by someone else and you weren't uh, like a, either an artisanal craftsman or a farmer um, relying off your own labor, right? If you had to sell your labor to others in order to um, make a wage to support yourself, you might be beholden to the interests of, say, um, whoever is financing your debt, whoever um, is employing you, whoever you are renting your home from. So if you were beholden to other people, you were viewed as, uh, as less desirable to participate in the political system because you might then just um, do what your boss or your, uh, your debt financer wants you to do in exchange for um, maybe a less lax enforcement of rents or, or debt payments, or maybe um, there might be hidden arrangements in place to make sure that you vote uh, in accordance with their interests instead of with your own interests and that would give them undue representation. So this, uh, this family farm is the bedrock as relatively uh, independent and self-sufficient. Um, this preference of, for an agrarian republic as Thomas Jefferson called it is definitely part of this driving force here. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the American frontier is being divided into like all these individual plots and you go there and then you never leave. And there is a, there is an interconnected nature to all of these, to all of these family farms. A lot of times uh, excessive, uh, an excess of food might be sent down um, to market in exchange for commodities or foods that you weren't growing yourself. So if you're growing a bunch of corn, this doesn't mean that your family is going to only eat corn forever into eternity, but that you might have corn a lot of the time, but then you also send corn to market and then use that to finance thing, uh, buying other things. So like uh, wheat, bread, tobacco. Um, you usually don't eat tobacco, but that's another example of an early market commodity. Um, so all of these different, uh, these different farms would produce a, an excess of a, of a crop or they would create a product in addition to self-sufficiency. And um, these products could be used to purchase things that the farm couldn't necessarily uh, create itself. Uh, now you might be dependent on trade, but because there you were trading something else in exchange for something that you couldn't make yourself, you still weren't seen as beholden to other interests. Uh, the, uh, the agrarian small family farm is, is basically being seen as the one thing that's the least corruptible kind of social unit that you can base a Republican institution on. Now, these kinds of farm-based small production operations uh, are called cottage industries, right? The name's pretty easy to remember because it's an industry inside a cottage. It's not a sprawling industrial plant. It's not a workshop. It's, it's very kind of limited in, in its capabilities here. And a lot of times women, in addition to providing all of this reproductive labor, were also uh, expected to contribute um, a lot of their labor toward these cottage industries. What are some examples of a cottage industry, right? Well, uh, we talked about sending food to market. Um, if it takes a really long time to get food to a market, that can, uh, that can kind of limit what you can make on your, on your surplus crop there. So a lot of times, 
Um, specific forms of food preservation fall under an example of a cottage industry. We have beets. If we just ship the beets out and it takes a month to get to this market, uh, they might go bad. So maybe we'll can and, um, and pickle them. An example of food preservation, if uh, we have an excessive amount of meat, maybe we'll salt the meat so that it's good to transport um, and we can sell meat on, on the market if we're not eating it. So there's a lot of different, uh, there's labor that goes into the process of taking these raw, um, either you know raw meat or just like crop surplus and turning it into something that can be sent to a market for sale. Um, there's the creation of productive components uh, you might be wondering what's a productive component. It's basically something that you aren't producing out of the ground yourself, uh, but isn't a finished product when it's produced either. So a good example of this is yarn, right? You might have um, you might have cotton or wool that go uh, that can go into a textile production, um, but in order to create textiles, you first need to have these bolts of fabric. You first need to have uh, the stringed yarn to sew um, this, these textiles together. So creating these productive components, right? Operating a loom and creating bolts of fabric or spinning yarn is an example of a cottage industry. There's also just outright textile production. Once you have these components, you can, um, you can sew clothes together. A lot of farms were self-sufficient in the creation of their textiles whenever possible because it was incredibly expensive to take all of these agricultural components ship them somewhere so they could be spun into bolts of fabric or spun into yarn and then ship somewhere else so that they could be sewn into clothes and then shift again to a market where you could buy ready-made clothes. It was an incredibly labor-intensive process earlier in history and so a lot of, uh, a lot of farms were self-sufficient in their textile production and then um, they might uh, create additional garments of clothing that could be sold for, that could be sold on the market and that's another example of a cottage industry. There's also any kind of household manufacturing. Um, if, uh, if you built furniture, this isn't necessarily labor that would be performed entirely by women, but processes or parts of turning uh, timber or other sorts, of, uh, other sorts of productive components into a finished piece of furniture would involve a lot of steps. And so that might, a lot of that might be shifted onto the ta uh, tasks associated with the domestic sphere, for example. And there's also uh, the production of general home goods. So maybe you're not making furniture, but um, if you know how to dip uh, weighted wicks and wax over and over again until eventually you have enough wax drying up to the point where you have a candle, candle making is a good example of a cottage industry. Um, Shoemaking uh, was a more, more of a skilled trade but if uh, you had lower economic means or you were kind of far away uh, from, uh, from a settlement where there might be a shoemaker, shoemaking might be another example of a cottage industry that, that a family farm would undertake. So in addition to all of the reproductive labor, a lot of women were also given uh, tasks on these family farms that were related toward cottage industries. Now this is actually um, when we're going to start getting away from the revolutionary American period. And part of me thought about taking these slides and, and pushing them back to a later date, uh, but I didn't want to introduce the concept uh, and the idea of cottage industries being performed uh, alongside reproductive labor without also talking about what ultimately happens to cottage industries and how that changes um, labor that women were performing uh, earlier on in American history. And so now that we have an understanding of cottage industries, right, of these small productive uh, enterprises that are based on these agricultural family farms, they, we also can now talk about how the process of industrialization um, began to erode these, um, these cottage industries and make them less profitable, um, make them less practical, thereby limiting the kinds of work that um, women could expect to, to do as time went on. So as you may or may not know, 
as we go further and further into the 1800s, kind of leaving behind this revolutionary period. Again, you can end it in 1800, you can end it in 1820, you can even go so far as 1850. But as you get further and further away uh, from the American Revolution, you have uh, the introduction of increasingly more complex kinds of industrial processes, right? So in the 1700s, you may have, um, uh, if you're, for example, if we want to stick with textile production, if you're going into textile production, um, you can go out and collect enough cotton, and then you can thresh that cotton long enough to get kind of all of these impurities out of it, and then you can kind of thresh it some more until the point where the cotton is actually like starting to stick together and like become one bolt of fabric, and then you can run it through a loom uh, until you have like an actual, an actual bolt of cotton fabric this was a very labor intensive uh, practice. And some of, the first, uh, some of the first industrial innovations that we start to see uh, changing the shape of work in uh, the early American Republic are industrial processes um, and more complex tools uh, in the textile industry actually. The US industrializes very rapidly because it starts to import um, and build machines that make textile production much easier. And we're actually gonna spend a little bit more time on the textile industry and then specifically the cotton industry as a source of national wealth for the United States in our next lecture when we talk about the Civil War. But for now, um, without getting too far into it, the textile industry was very lucrative for the US. It turned it from kind of this agrarian, uh, this agrarian new republic on kind of the outskirts of the Atlantic world, uh, increasingly into a more uh, internationally relevant industrial power. And it was because uh, textile production uh, could be done quicker for cheaper. The cotton gin is an example. This was a machine where you would put cotton into this, uh, this feeding sluice and you would turn a crank and these kind of wire teeth would go uh, and kind of take these uh, different impurities out of the cotton for you so you weren't doing it by hand. Um, you instead would just have to turn a crank and all of the leaves and kind of the seeds and stems that had been mixed in with these uh, balls of cotton would just be removed. And by the time you had uh, cotton coming out through the cotton gin, it was more or less ready to thrash into like an actual bolt of fabric. This, uh, the cotton gin um, did two things. First, it made the system of slavery much more lucrative because slaves themselves could do a lot more work and the amount of resources a plantation or a slave master had to allocate toward um, housing and feeding slaves could be a lot less because you would have slaves doing a lot more work uh, on an individual basis. So in some ways the cotton gin, like these kinds of innovations actually allowed the system of slavery to exist for for longer than it may have without these innovations because it made uh, industries related to slavery much more profitable than they otherwise would have been. At the same time, the cotton gin and kind of like these tools that are similar uh, to making textile production easier start to chip away at the ability of small independent farms to uh, kind of compete in a market, right? These cottage industries become less and less profitable because if you can't afford um, these, at the time, very expensive machines to kind of make your, to make your production go quicker, then you were ultimately just sinking a lot of labor into a task uh, to create something that was just becoming cheaper and cheaper on an open market. And so as, uh, as complex machines, not only in textiles, but in other kinds of uh, other kinds of industries related to into cottage production. As these start to become um, more widespread, more adopted, industrial production starts to become more centralized in urban areas and cottage industries start to die out. And this means um, women in the revolutionary and colonial periods who might have started to learn trades or skills um, that they otherwise might not have, suddenly there's, um, there's a decline in demand for these skills again as industrialization starts to take hold in the US 
And so their opportunities for different kinds of work are, uh, are again reduced. Now, this isn't to say that, you know, the cotton gin shows up in the late 1700s and boom, suddenly cottage industries die out and women don't have, uh, don't have as many different um, tasks to do anymore and they don't have as many options on how, to, on how they want to, um, you know, work and labor in their lives. But it is a gradual process across the 1800s and by the end of the 1800s, cottage industries are essentially extinct. Um, Ready-made clothing, this textile industry, uh, is one of the earlier onsets, and it's also one of these last holdouts where um, some farms might not actively like send uh, cottage industry-made clothes to market, but family farms might still produce uh, clothing and, as a means of self-sufficiency. By the time uh, the 1800s are, ed are ending, Textile production is so cheap and efficient, it just doesn't make sense to even make your own clothes. And so ready-made clothes become an increasing, something that you would uh, just increasingly buy just in like a general store or even in a department store if you're in an urban area of the time. This means that not only, um, not only are cottage industries dying and the kinds of labor that women are allowed to do, um, not only are those opportunities shrinking, but women's control of the process of production itself starts to decline. So prior to industrialization, workers very easily could set their own hours and their own conditions of work. This is again, um, something that we're going to get more into uh, as we approach the topic of industrialization after our, our discussion on the Civil War. But suffice it to say that as industrial production becomes more centralized and it becomes more planned by employers, by industrial companies, workers lose uh, more and more control of their say in the productive process. Prior to industrialization, men and women alike didn't necessarily have to punch in, um, punch in to begin working at a certain time. They weren't required to work a certain amount of hours in a day. You simply worked as much as you needed to. And uh, if you were on an agrarian, a small family farm, you know, you would definitely work more throughout the summer and into the fall to kind of follow uh, crop cycles. But in the winter and into the spring a little bit, you had a much uh, reduced workload. You could devote um, your time to other energies. With industrialization, this also changes. And there's more of a regimentation in American work. Um, along uh, notions of time and how much work are you doing for an employer in a certain amount of time in exchange for a wage. These start to kind of reshape how Americans view labor. This is also another reason sometimes why a labor history course will start in 1877 is because this is when you really start to see institutions and notions of wage labor take off in contrast to earlier models where a worker would have more of a say in how they made their own goods. and after industrialization, a worker has less of a say how they make goods for someone else. So let's talk about women who go to work amid the, uh, the process of industrialization, right? Textile production is still very much a, uh, nowadays um, people would call it a pink collar job. Obviously that term didn't exist back then. Um, but pink collar, if you like contrast it with, uh, with blue and white collar of like uh, um, skilled and unskilled manual labor versus kind of professional uh, non-manual labor, pink collar is women's labor. Pink collar jobs are routinely kind of devalued and underpaid because they're associated with femininity and there's like this implicit cultural and social bias that that work is less valuable and less difficult and so it deserves less pay. Um, that's the first thing you should probably know about women who went to start working in textile mills uh, as industrial processes caught up to the United States. Women began working in textile mills because a lot of these cottage industries uh, started to um, evaporate and die. This meant that smaller family farms had uh, fewer commodities that they could trade in an open market for things that they couldn't make themselves, right? You might want, um, for example, a, a wagon or a wheelbarrow to move your equipment around. 
But if you don't have the lumber on your property, if you don't have the tools to make that wagon, you need to find some other way to pay for it. And with the erosion of these cottage industries, uh, you know, you can't, um, you can't provide bolts of fabric, you can't provide like distilled alcohol, you can't provide these things that a cottage industry might normally produce. And so now what needs to happen uh, is if possible, someone on the farm needs to go away and work in one of these urban areas for wages. And with textile production being among the first industrial processes, a lot of times the first workers who entered into, um, into mills, uh, kind of the forerunner of the modern factory, were women workers, right? Textile production was a pink collar industry. Women um, knew how to do it best. And so women will be, uh, will be working in these factories. It was also very lucrative for the owners of mills also. Keep in mind, we have the system of coverture, right? There is this social and cultural assumption, even if this isn't the, uh, universally true for every woman working in these mills, but there's this assumption um, across society that women are under the system of coverture, right? And so if a woman is assumed to either be dependent on their father or dependent on their husband, usually it was their father because when you were married, you were not allowed to work in any of these mills anymore. Um, but if it was assumed that you had, that your welfare was being taken care of by uh, a man you were covered under, these mill owners did not have to pay uh, their workers a living wage, right? That means a wage on which you can support yourself um, without taking on a second or a third or a fourth job. If you already have, um, if you already have a family farm you're coming back from, uh, it is enough to provide women workers, uh, these mill owners would argue, with a dorm and some, a very small amount of, of pay that would normally be sent back home to the farm so that it could be used to support the family. Uh, but women were um, atrociously underpaid in a lot of these textile mills and in other aspects of uh, industrial employment. Now, I mentioned that this was usually a, uh, a system where women workers were expected to have, um, to have a father. They were expected to be um, covered under a father and not a husband. A lot of times women who uh, became married were simply just let go or excused. They retired or they were fired if they didn't leave willingly because there was, again, this cultural assumption that once you were married, you were going to start having children and the amount of labor you were going to be uh, doing in order to support rearing and raising those children, you know, providing them with that instruction that comes with, a re with Republican motherhood, that that reproductive labor was going to increase and you needed to focus on that. And so um, you're not going to continue to work in this mill. A lot of, uh, women therefore, even with the, with the emergence of industrialization, were not guaranteed any kind of career path outside the home. Um, there was uh, prevailing all of uh, the opportunities women had to, to leave um, rural communities and go start working in mills in some of these urban areas. Uh, that was tied still to cultural assumptions that you're going to be married, you're only here for a short time. And because uh, you're covered under uh, the authority of some man in your life. And because we're providing you with a dorm, we can pay you very, very little. little. So work for women um, in, industrial, in an industrial setting was often uh, very unfulfilling and not a, a joyous prospect, even though um, you might kind of intrinsically want to believe it was because uh, the advent of industrialization means that more and more women are leaving the home. There's still very strict and regimented controls placed on women to modi to kind of like oversee and dictate their behavior, even if they aren't living at home. Um, a lot of times when girls would go off to start working in some of these early textile mills, their boss would, um, would undertake a lot of the responsibilities of coverture that were often associated with their fathers. So uh, you, uh, your boss, um, the owner of the mill or some sort of administrative apparatus uh, that was a part of the mill would very uh, would very consistently and um, and brutally tell you you know you will be in bed at this amount of time you're not allowed to be out of the dorms after this amount of time all the lights have to be off at this amount of time you can't see or date people um, 
that's something that you're going to do back in your home community that, you know, if there's an arranged marriage system, you're going to do that. You're not going to go off on dates. There was a lot of uh, censorship and surveillance of girls who went to work in, an, in early industrial mills. And that was part of the system of coverture that basically said, you know, hey, um, women are property and they need to kind of be chaperoned as such or not, you know, maybe even not property, but they were infantilized and were not viewed as full citizens like men were. And so they needed to kind of be protected and, and overseen. Remember that protection, right? That's, there are benevolent and hostile versions of sexism. So whatever kind of minimal freedoms uh, the industrial process gives to women, that eventually starts to run into its, its own issues. And before we get into that though, um, we should step back and take a look again at, at Republican motherhood, right? Because prior to these notions of Republican motherhood, prior to uh, society kind of um, shifting in tone a little bit and recognizing that domestic labor and reproductive labor were inherently valuable and they weren't necessarily something that you could just look down on, that was something that was a virtue and very much needed. Um, once this shift starts to happen, women have more educational opportunities, right? Uh, there is a desire for Republican mothers to know about uh, civic institutions, to kind of have this civic education. Um, there is this desire for mothers to be literate because if a mother is literate, that means that a son is going to be literate. You really want to have a literate um, male workforce in this early republic. And then you also have these religious institutions where women are more and more encouraged to kind of uh, uh, learn from scripture, kind of familiarize themselves with uh, biblical theology, again, for the instruction of primarily sons, but also daughters. This education prov is, uh, provides the first kind of backbone um, in American history for uh, women's political power, right? You start to see uh, women's organizations, uh, they can either be um, like from alumni associations, from religious institutions or girls colleges uh, where women went to learn, um, very much gendered educational information information and knowledge. Uh, so there would be alumni associations from these kinds of religious institutions that women would frequent and they uh, would meet on a regular basis and they would start to share ideas. And these sorts of, uh, these sorts of clubs and associations led women to begin arguing uh, in favor of domestic reforms that they felt would be, that they felt were common sense reforms for, for the Republic, obviously. So an example of progressive reforms that ultimately kind of grows out of this early, um, these early nexuses of political power include like child labor laws, right? A lot of the, um, of the leading ab advocates against child labor during the progressive era were women. Um, they were able to kind of articulate their, their authority in uh, advocating for the welfare of children and against child labor because um, the welfare of children was one of these aspects of society that fell under this domestic sphere. So even though women, um, educated women were arguing for uh, policy changes on within the realm of the public sphere, it was related to the domestic sphere. And so there was this gendered dynamic where they were able to make headway in, in political reforms uh, based on what the reform was addressing. Um, the temperance movement, which uh, leads to a brief period of prohibition in the United States is, is an example of, um, of a progressive reform that it ultimately eventually is able to make its way out of these uh, early formations of women's political organizations. Um, women's suffrage is another, but also some of uh, the earlier anti uh, the earlier abolitionists and kind of anti-slavery advocates were women as well. Not only uh, white women, but women of color were involved. Sojourner Truth, who you see uh, on the bottom right there, was a former slave who um, gave a uh, famed speech at a Ohio uh, uh, delegation of women suffragists. 
in uh, the mid 1800s. Sojourner Truth um, gave a lot of, uh, of credence to the cause of women's suffrage. She wasn't afraid to yell back at, at male hecklers in the audience who were um, verbally accosting women who were speaking out for voting rights. Uh, ultimately, when suffrage comes uh, closer to being a reality, it's rather unfortunate that um, women of color will be marginalized by that progressive movement. But some of the earliest abolitionists and uh, women suffragists uh, were associations of women who crossed racial lines. Now, once you start to have these women's uh, political organizations fighting for reforms, not only in uh, issues of political representation like suffrage, but also uh, very clear labor terms, right? So uh, in advocating for abolition, that is a, that is a labor issue. In advocating against child, um, again, advocating against child labor, that's also a labor issue. In advocating for shorter work days uh, so that um, husbands or wives, if they're also working, can come home and see their children. That's also a labor issue, but it's couched in terms of the domestic sphere. And so a lot of times historians will approach these progressive causes and they'll gender them on, on women's terms. And while that's not necessarily uh, incorrect of them to do so, because they are um, even today still very much uh, broken up into this dichotomy of masculine and feminine gender roles, it's also worth noting that a lot of times there was considerable overlap uh, in these gendered progressive causes and uh, causes of labor rights, of workers' rights, and of of fair treatment and respect on the workplace. This isn't to say that uh, the early labor history is a specifically uh, feminine issue. There were also articulations or expressions of desires for, for workers' rights and equitable labor um, coming uh, from a masculinist discourse as well. Like a, if you're a real man, you can join a union and you can argue for, for fair wages, right? There were also masculine articulations of, of the labor movement early on. But a lot of times, uh, the idea of manhood being tied to respectable labor very much drowns out um, women's involvement in the emerging labor movement. And so it's, uh, it's especially worth recognizing that here. Now, as these professional institutions start to take root, though, um, they increasingly uh, become solidified under the public sphere. And so you have the emergence of this issue of professionalization. And this is basically when um, skilled, uh, skilled labor in the public sphere, largely addressing domestic issues, starts to become supplanted by professional men. This starts to happen toward the end of the 1800s, actually, with this uh, 1877 start date in mind. Um, a good example is uh, our female midwives. Um, midwives were basically, uh, they were women who either could live in um, with uh, a family who uh, was expecting a pregnancy, especially if they're incredibly wealthy, but more often than not, a midwife would, would frequent different houses. And they performed a number of tasks uh, that were related to the to um, you know, reproduction, birth, raising children, these sorts of things. Predominantly uh, a female um, type of labor it was associated with that domestic sphere, even though you're going out in public to other people's homes to help facilitate pregnancy and birth. Um, but as the midwife profession starts to become more public facing, especially with uh, the processes of urbanization, with industrialization, with uh, commerce kind of entering into some of these service agreements and not just manufacturing, you see men start to uh, start to regulate these professions. And if you're going to be doing any sorts of of medical work, you know you need to get so many certifications. Well, that kind of education isn't accessible to a lot of women still. And so you gradually see female midwives being replaced with predominantly male medical professions like obstetricians or pediatricians instead. Uh, similarly, organizations that the government had recognized to take charge on, you know, nominally women's issues in the domestic sphere, so like child labor, 
for um, domestic assault sometimes in different states that were markedly progressive might have um, women's organizations supplying recommendations on how to curb those problems. Governments increasingly turned over those committees and those uh, councils to male representatives instead of women representatives who initially constructed them. Now, so we're seeing here uh, that industrialization and, uh, and this education process tied to Republican motherhood in some ways both expanded and limited the opportunities uh, for women in terms not only of labor and of the economy, but in wider uh, society and in political representation as well, right? So you have the erosion of cottage industries and they're being replaced with industrial processes. This gives women uh, a lot of women a ticket away from the home to kind of see other parts of the country and live somewhere else, um, not independently, but perhaps um, under less direct uh, oversight from their father. They're still subject to uh, patriarchal oversight, but it's maybe uh, less pronounced and less glaring depending on one's home life. That being said, at the same time, the kinds of work that you're going to be expected to perform um, can be constricted in some ways. Whereas with cottage industries, you could be taught and expected to perform a variety of, of tasks associated with different forms of production. With industrialization, especially working in textile mills, um, that labor is going to get de-skilled and you're going to more, more and more and more increasingly be consigned to just one part of the productive process. So maybe uh, instead of spending one day um, helping prepare uh, furniture or textiles, doing yarn spinning and looming, um, and then going on another day and doing food preparation. Now it's, uh, it's 60 hours a week, 10 hour days, except for Sunday because of the Christmas effect and it's the Lord's day. You know, you might be doing 60 hours a week where you're just standing at a loom press manning machinery. And so that, uh, while you're getting out of the home, what are you getting out of the home to is something that, uh, it's a, it's a qualifier there, right? Similarly, you look at education. It provides women with some of the first uh, avenues uh, toward political power and political involvement, even though the right to vote has not been won yet. This, uh, at the same time, though, uh, prompts a blowback where a lot of the spaces that women are able to make in the public sphere ultimately are again lost because of this process of professionalization. So, well, you can now read, you can now exchange letters, you can now meet with, uh, with organizations like alumni associations from these women colleges. Um, the kinds of work that you're allowed to do with that can really depend on how much of that work uh, is trying to be appropriated by professional men and how much of it isn't. There's actually a lot of historiographic debates around uh, women's experiences during this time. So if any of this lecture has kind of seemed a little bit jumpy, is because I'm really trying to juggle two different and sometimes contradictory arguments here. And I wanna kind of provide you with two more books that are kind of not necessarily into in direct opposition with each other, but offer um, a lot of evidence that kind of points us to reach different conclusions. The first is Nancy Cott's Bonds of Womanhood. And this is uh, her study of the women's sphere, right, this domestic sphere uh, in New England from the end of the 1700s until like the first third of the 1800s. So about this uh, 50 to 60 year period, this revolutionary American period. Now Nancy Cott specifically argues that society was more egalitarian and equal under the colonial system than it was under the system uh, that uh, came to take shape after American independence. And she specifically points to cottage industries that are lost during the industrialization process that kind of reduce women's economic and social agency by limiting the extent of what the domestic sphere is, right? So when all of these cottage industries start to go away, the kinds of economic opportunities that women have also start to shrink. And even though you can now leave your home, 
if you're a younger woman who hasn't married yet and you have permission from your father, even though you can now leave home and go to uh, an urban place and get a job in a textile mill maybe, this isn't necessarily the same kind of freedom that women wanted during the, during the colonial system. Now, for Nancy Cott, this actually explains why there's not a very sizable women's movement prior to independence, right? Um, women and their husbands, even though they were under the system of coverture, uh, had higher status under the colonial system because their labor was much more needed, right? If the reproductive labor wasn't being performed on the farm, who was going to do it? Versus after the industrial process, um, that reproductive labor on a farm is still there, but it's reduced. Um, and so there is a devaluation of women's labor, therefore, and so women are being uh, increasingly kind of marginalized and pushed aside, and that's why we have the emergence of these women's organizations. Now, not in direct conflict, but kind of in contrast, we have Mary Beth Norton, and she writes uh, in Liberty's Daughters that women were less vocal for demands for equality and opportunity before uh, the revolution, specifically because the system of coverture. There wasn't an ideological, um, there wasn't an ideological framework like Republican motherhood to contest the system of coverture. And so women were just kind of socially and culturally imbued with this idea that coverture was just, that's how things were and why change it. Um, once you have the American Revolution and you have this idea of Republican motherhood, and you have this, these ideas of, of domestic and reproductive labor as being a valuable uh, civic and patriotic duty. Once you have those kinds of articulations being kind of injected into popular uh, dialogue and discourse, you start to see that stuff written and women can actually read. That allows women to kind of increasingly challenge the systems that they're finding themselves under and begin to ask questions, well, why are we treated different from men? And why can't women, um, you know, this isn't to say, uh, why can't women be full equals? That was for a very long time viewed as this very radical concept that not a lot of people ascribe to, but maybe why can't women have uh, legal protections from their husband, right? Why can't women um, be afforded these, uh, these economic or workplace opportunities that are afforded to men and not us, especially if we can do them just as well. And so you have kind of these two, uh, these two conflicting views of the past, where one says that women's experiences uh, became less available and they became more restricted because of industrialization, whereas others say that economic opportunity very well may have declined, but that because women were able to access education and literacy at higher rates, they were able to challenge um, patriarchal and misogynist systems more vocally. Those two things aren't necessarily uh, mutually exclusive, right? They can very easily overlap. Um, but this is a kind of one example of a historiographic debate around labor that isn't really solved. Right. Um, whether or not you agree with Nancy Cott or Elizabeth uh, Mary Beth Norton more um, really just depends on how you read history and how you understand uh, historical evidence, and which historical evidence you're familiar with. But that historiographic debate aside, let's go ahead and pause and recap here, right, because there's a couple of takeaways that we should be that we should be moving on this lecture uh, with. The first is that the economic impact and value of American labor in the early Republic was dependent off of and enriched by unpaid women's labor. And this could be, uh, both be productive labor that was, um, that was created in cottage industries and then later in textile mills. Keep in mind that um, that labor was productive, but it was uh, more or less unpaid because those wages went back to the family and were not kept by um, the mill girls working in these textile mills, as well as, uh, again, un, um, unpaid reproductive labor. So uh, maintaining the domestic sphere, uh, which then enabled everyone living in a household to participate in the economy and participate in productive processes, be it industrial, agricultural, or otherwise. 
The second point, structural inequalities uh, along gendered lines have limited women's economic opportunities throughout American history. Uh, sexism and sex-based discrimination, contrary to what some people on uh, very kind of fringe wings of politics today might argue, were not just invented by feminists. They've actually uh, are very deeply entrenched uh, in American history and they also are felt today, right? This is not only demonstrated in like civic and political ways, so like women weren't allowed to vote until about a hundred years ago, and that's white women, but also in fields of labor. So if we look at the pay gap, for example, and uh, pay discrepancies in pink collar labor in contrast to white or blue collar labor, women are paid much less and a feminized positions are undervalued. And that stems from this kind of patriarchal uh, sexist system of male supremacy. And then lastly, um, historians are still divided over the specific nature of women's uh, experiences. And this is in labor as well as in other aspects of history. And this is not because uh, historians just don't do historical work. It's not, like the, it's not like the resources to find these things out aren't necessarily there, but that normative history for so long has only privileged the voices of, uh, of middle-class or rich white men that the lived experiences of other groups that are not uh, included in that, in that specific identity have just been largely overlooked. And so women's history, just like labor history, is still very much an emerging and growing field of history. Um, history isn't static, of course. There's always new contributions being added. But specifically, these subaltern um, histor historic tendencies, these tender tendencies that kind of speak back to this, this hegemonic normative narrative that privil privileges whiteness um, and affluence and, uh, and maleness. These kinds of discourses that are speaking back to this normative history have not been around very long. Barbara Welter's uh, articulation of the culture of domesticity, right, of these two separate spheres, is only slightly more than 50 years old. Uh, but we've been studying history since before the creation of the United States. Um, and so a lot of these debates are still ongoing because we don't we can't conclusively say if Nancy Cott or Mary Beth Norton is right, or if they're both right in some uh, different kind of way. So uh, women's history, labor history, they're still very much growing fields. They're still very much relevant fields. And the fact that there is so much disagreement on the past, uh, especially around issues of labor and gender, uh, just demonstrate how much we don't know and how much historical work uh, is, still needs to be done. With that, we're going to conclude this lecture. Um, I am just going to go ahead and remind you that for our next class discussion, you'll want to read chapter one of 10 Strikes. That's actually gonna talk about Lowell Mill Girls and the development of American capitalism. And also make sure to uh, finish Jennifer uh, Morgan's Laboring Women because we'll be uh, concluding our discussion on that text for our next class. And then of course, if you have not gotten me back your introduction questionnaire or your uh, preferences for presenting and note-taking, please do so as soon as possible because any slots that are still available that you might be interested in are going to start filling up as I get people sending me their responses, right? So it's better uh, to send three over two in case two of your, your preferences are taken just to make sure you're still presenting on a topic that you want to. Um, with that all out there, I'm looking forward to a lively discussion next class. Have a great day.